that, I would like to introduce Michael Sabella, who is an associate in both Baker Hollister's Bankruptcy and Restructuring Group and its Security and Governance Litigation Group. Um, he assists debitors, creditors, and interested parties in a variety of industries on all aspects of representation on bankruptcy issues, including claims recovery, secure transactions, real estate, international, international insolvencies, and corporate insolvencies. Michael also represents corporate officers and directors in litigation that challenges their actions and roles in the connection with the management and operations of businesses. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Hello, Samantha. How are you? Great. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about being a lawyer. Uh, everything that Samantha just read is what I do, but it all sounds terribly boring and there's no context for it whatsoever. So I'll just start at the beginning. So why did I become a lawyer? Um, when I was in college, I really enjoyed politics and I really enjoyed uh, learning about why government acted the way it did and what were the, the parameters of that, how people police themselves, how people policed um, society, how government police society, and how things were analyzed um, when looking at laws in case there were disputes or issues that came up between individuals. Because um, you can imagine in college having debates with your friends was a constant thing that I do all the time. Um, so while I was doing that, I was talking to professors and I really got into the idea of political involvement and governance. And out of that came the question of law and the constitution and all that stuff. And I spoke with professors who advised I should go to law school because they said it would give me an insight into um, the development of laws and the application of the laws. And so I wasn't thrilled about the idea, to be honest. Um, but I took a few classes, uh, I took con law classes in college, and I really just enjoyed the, the debate and the back and forth that would happen with um, my classmates and the professors. And so I decided to apply to law school. But before I did that, I actually interned for a judge in Nassau County, uh, which is on Long Island, which is where we are. Um, sorry. That judge was a domestic violence court judge. And what I would do when I was interning was I would assist the judge and her staff in um, administering the cases that were before her, doing research on issues that came up. And I really was able to see firsthand, not just the abstract of the, this is the law, but like what actually was the law and how it was used to protect individuals who were in domestic violence situations. And that really helped propel me to decide to apply to law school. And you, I remember when I was younger watching Law and Order or any of the law shows that were out there. And the, the best part about those shows was just how exciting things always were. You, you'd watch these prosecutors and they would walk up to the witnesses during testimony or they'd walk around the jury room where they have these lavish discussions and these huge speeches. And don't get me wrong, law has all of those things. Um, but law shows don't really show you the actual nitty gritty part of the law. The nitty gritty part of the law is researching, it's drafting. And what are you drafting? You're drafting motions. And what are motions? So let me go back a little bit. When a lawsuit is filed, a lot of research has to go into that lawsuit. What causes of action, what claims can you bring against someone or against a company um, for a harm that you suffered? I mean, there's lots of things that come up in law school about, you know, can anyone just bring a lawsuit? I mean, everyone wants to say you could sue anyone and you really can just file a lawsuit, but that lawsuit, if there's no merit to it and you have no, no real rights, no real injury to complain of, will get thrown out by a judge. So before you file a lawsuit, you have to go into this whole background of the case. Like what happened to you? What was caused? What, what was the harm? How have you suffered? And then you have to see, you know, are there laws on the books that it can address those things? So for example, if I get hit by a car, well, there are laws that govern personal injury and what can be done to, for me to protect my rights. I got injured. I need to seek redress somehow, some form of protection. Um, and a remedy in the court system. So there's all these different things that go into it. It's not just fancy arguing. And when you watch these shows, everyone seems to always spend like a thousand hours hanging out with their friends, 
talking and not actually doing any work. But the reality is the law is a lot of work and it's good work, um, but it's very involved. And that's what I, what I always found interesting about the law and people who, who've gone into the practice is they always most tend to not really know what to expect when they go in. They just know from what they've seen on TV, which is fair. Like you, you watch Grey's Anatomy, you watch sh any type of shows and you're like, oh, I know what that person does because I've seen it on TV. Well, as seen on TV is not always as, as seen in reality. Um, so that, that's the law and just the idea of it. So as you get into it, you get really into the application and discussion of it. And I feel like I'm doing a little bit of rambling, but th the point is, is that um, what you do with the law can truly impact and change someone else's life. That is one of the best things about it. If you're advocating for people or if you're protecting someone's rights or if you're doing something to help someone else, what you are doing matters. And that does, and that's the same for every profession. But in the law, you really do see tangible efforts and results. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, how this always works. But you really do see like how the sausage is made and, and what you can do and when you wield it, you, if you wield it appropriately. And appropriate doesn't always mean you'll win, which is unfortunate, that's just life. But that's just how this whole process works. Um, so let me go now and talk a little bit about my job. So I, as Samantha read, am a, a bankruptcy and restructuring attorney by trade. And that will probably mean nothing because no one really likes to think about these things. I didn't like to think about it either. When I went to law school, I thought I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer um, because I liked going to watching movies and I liked watching TV and reading books. Um, but what I found is that I had gone to law school in 2004 to 2007. And that was right around the time of Hurricane Katrina and around the time of a very big change in how bankruptcy law is uh, applied in this country. There was a, a whole amendment to the bankruptcy code, which is a whole separate area of federal law that governs how bankruptcies are um, administered and processed in this country. And what I was able to do is I went down to Katrina with my law school, down to New Orleans, sorry, after Katrina to help out with people who had been harmed um, by the storm. Um, obviously physical injuries, but legal remedies that they needed. And one day, and I was assigned to a lawyer who did bankruptcy work in New Orleans. And he was able to talk to me and show me through his clients um, the real impact that the bankruptcy law would have on individuals and the problems that they may face due to certain requirements under the bankruptcy code. The bankruptcy code requires um, debtors to provide certain paperwork to uh, what's called a bankruptcy trustee, someone who administered their bankruptcy case. But if you're in the middle of a natural disaster or a huge storm, like that stuff's gone. And that's kind of inspired me to write an article on the real impact that the bankruptcy law and the amendments would have on individuals who faced natural disaster. I didn't know I wanted to get into bankruptcy law. It just like slowly developed for me into this profession. And from there, I ended up going for essentially a fourth year of law school, which is called an LLM degree, a legal master's of law. And I got that, which is in specifically in bankruptcy law. So I could get a more targeted training on that. And it really showed me how corporations address bankruptcy cases, how people who are creditors address bankruptcy cases, how debtors address bankruptcy cases. And these things are all part of this huge puzzle of economic and financial issues that come up in society that most people don't really like talking about. Like my frequent line whenever I tell people I'm a bankruptcy lawyer is, oh, really? Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that it, it is a necessary part of the financial ecosystem for our country and internationally. And bankruptcy and solvency laws are prevalent throughout the world. And you can have in, international bankruptcies impact in the US and vice versa. So what happened was, is I went from there and I went to clerk for a bankruptcy judge, it's a lot of bankruptcy. Um, and while clerking for the judge, and what that means is I was actually now directly assisting the court in um, administering the bankruptcy cases that came before her. So I would write memos for her on issues of law that came up. I would write memos for her 
um, questions of fact, questions that she maybe want to ask the, the attorneys when they came before her, questions that uh, witnesses may have to answer, it would analyze massive filings that would come in. And all this was really great because not only did it give me a chance to see what judges did um, in their chambers and not in court and really understand like how they process cases, but also gave me a chance to really see how lawyers practiced. I mean, I would be in court and we would come back and she would either tell me that, you know, do what that lawyer did when you go into practice or never do what that person did ever when you are an attorney. Um, so that was a, a great experience for me and it really helped me see the inner workings of the courtroom. And then I went into practice myself and I, I was first at a, a smaller firm on Long Island, again, doing bankruptcy work. And from there, I ended up going to my current firm where I've been for four years and I'm doing more bankruptcy work. And that's just kind of the, the flow of it. It's been uh, a longer road to get uh, here. It's been 13 years since law school, which is kind of scary. Um, but it's been an exciting journey and you really see every aspect of the law as much as possible. Um, one thing that my, my judge told me is that the reason why she liked bankruptcy law so much is it can really touch upon every aspect of the law. Like you could have a bankruptcy issue come up in the context of a, a corporate case. You could have a bankruptcy issue come up in a personal injury case, intellectual property case, employment case tax cases, real property. Bankruptcy touches upon all these things because bankruptcy is a very, very broad encompassing area of the law. Um, and that's a really fun part about it. Like you know, no day is ever the same. I mean, the fundamentals of it are like you come in, you do emails, you do work, but the, the issues that come up, the law that you have to analyze and review, those can all change. They don't. Um, Sam? Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to ask, um, could you talk a little bit about your educational path? Like exactly. I know, obviously, you were talking about how you were um, originally in college and then you decided to go to law school and things like that. So what kind of was like, what were you majoring in? What did you how did you get to law school? Things like that. Sure. Um, so when I was in law school, I sorry, when I was in college, I double majored. I did a political science major and a business administration major, mostly because my parents told me you can't just do a political science major, you need to do something else. Um, so I doubled business administration, which actually did help. I mean, they, they teach you accounting principles and stuff like that, that you really would not have any experience at all when you were going to poli sci classes. Um, but also when I was in college, in addition to the, the classes I took, I did a lot of um, internships uh, for, political organization that had a lot of lawyers, as well as I took a lot of extracurricular activities that involved debates, um, analysis of issues that could come up, drafting and writing. And those were all like sort of like combined into the push to go to law school. It was sort of like the natural flow of everything. And then when I went to law school, I got involved in local uh, Inter organization that needed assistance. I worked for the Nassau County DA's office for two semesters doing um, memos, brief drafting for them. I worked for small law firms uh, doing work for them. I did legal clinics when I was in law school. And what legal clinics are in law school are um, pro bono focused school sponsored entities. And what that means is, is that the school will let law students under the assistance and supervision of attorneys, practicing attorneys, assist people in the local community that can't afford lawyers by themselves. And, and that's one of the things that I have taken into my practice is the importance of, of that type of work. People there's a reason you, they say you have the right to an attorney when they read you the Miranda rights. Everyone should have access to a lawyer. It can be a scary system to go into it without having that kind of assistance. What law school is very good at doing is teaching you how to critically analyze documents and parse through and spot issues that could come up in a case. Like I could read a paragraph before law school and think I saw one issue and that kind of 
big, so let me give you more example. Let's say I was reading um, a newspaper article about a car accident. Well, before law school, I would look at that and say, all right, maybe there's liability between the person who got hit and the person that um, hit them. After law school, the question is, well, how is the street maintained when the accident happened? Were the lights working? Who was supposed to monitor the lights? Was there a building in front? Was the building supposed to do anything? Did they um, get into an accident because someone else was across the street and flashing lights in the view of the driver? I mean, there's all types of things that just would, you wouldn't naturally see. The best example I can give actually is um, a friend of mine was at, a, an, a, at our college and she was with a friend of hers who was a lawyer and my friend was a student and there was a child playing on steps and the lawyer looks at my friend and goes, what do you see when you look at that? And my friend goes, I see an adorable kid playing on the steps. And she goes, why, what do you see? And the lawyer goes, a massive amount of liability because she just saw these things. She, she had learned to look for what could have gone wrong. And already she was processing what needs to be done in that situation. Um, so that's what I enjoyed about law school the most is they really do teach you to consider issues and analyze issues in, in, a, in a way that you really wouldn't get without having gone to law school. Now, you may get that kind of analysis while you've been working in other jobs, but law school is specific to that. Um, but those are the things that you, know, you do in law school. Like they'll, they'll teach you in the first few years of law school uh, certain core classes you have to take. Contracts, property, torts. However, you can take electives after that. And what that is, is those are classes that are interesting to you in the law that are not re required courses but maybe you want to pursue a career in that. Like I took classes in trust and estates because I thought that stuff was fascinating. I took classes in bankruptcy because I thought that was interesting. Never anything in entertainment law. That was probably a bit close. Um, but that's fun. And when you when you go, if you decide you do want to go to law school, what I, what I greatly encourage is you really take advantage of those types of electives and the programming because you, you you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into any one set idea of what you think you may or you may not want to do. It's easy to say, I want to do contracts the rest of my life, or I want to do litigation the rest of my life. But until you've done a trust in a state's case, or taking a class, you have no idea what that's like. And that should go for everything. Like if you're going to a college that has a wide variety of, of courses to take, I highly recommend taking as many different varieties of classes as possible because you really give you a chance and the ability to maybe learn something about yourself that could impact how you go about in your future in terms of a career or a graduate program or a volunteer effort or a political event. I mean, these are all things that can come out. I mean, one of the greatest things about school is the the ability for it to open up your mind into areas of law, of sorry, not law, but areas of practice and work that you may not have considered at all. I went to college thinking I wanted to do uh, computer science and I honestly forget what the other thing was. Um, clearly that did not happen. So uh, that, that's the, the, the best advice I can give you about going to college and then law school or any form of profession. And if you go to med school, there's, there's so many different varieties of classes you can take in med school. You, you really should take these chances to give yourself the opportunity to appreciate what is out there and allow yourself the opportunity to, to see what it's like. And if it's for you, you may go to law school and absolutely hate it in the first year. And then you know the law is not for you. Which is why I also recommend taking classes in, in college or high school about those things as well. Well, that actually leads me to my next question. So I know when you were saying in your undergraduate, you actually did not um, do pre-law, right? You just did political science and business administration. So it's not necessary. I think everybody kind of assumes that you need to take pre-law in order to get into law school, but that's not necessarily the case, correct? It is not at all. I know a ton of attorneys who never took a pre-law class or a program when they were in their college. I know attorneys who were bio majors who are now 
having the time of their life doing patent law as a lawyer, but they never would be able to get into that field if they hadn't done bio classes when they were in college. Um, I know attorneys who went to law school with an English degree. You know, attorneys went to law school with finance degrees, business degrees. One of the, the other things about law, I've been talking, I've, I'm a lawyer by, by practice and trade, but you can go to law school and not be a lawyer. And I mean that in the sense of practicing law. If you look at a lot of CEOs, professionals, you may find, if you look at their background, a lot of them have gone to law school because it gives you that critical thinking that assists them and helps them in their jobs. So I have, no, I have friends who have went to law school who now work for the Library of Congress. I have friends that went to law school who are now teachers, law teachers, college teachers, high school teachers, friends that go to law school who are now administrators. Friends who go to law school who are now doctors, which I, nothing against them, but that's so much schooling <laughs> um, and so many student loans. Uh, but the law is a really good path to open other doors to you that you may not know about or be able to walk through without the, the background assistance of having gone to law school. Well, that actually, again, leads into my next question was, I know you had stated that you, um, when you were in law school, then went back for an LMN degree, it's specifically in bankruptcy, right? Did I say that correct? Okay. So in order to practice a particular field of law, like entertainment law, or like you said, bankruptcy or any type of litigation, do you need to get those things or is, or is just a general law degree from, from like, how does that work? That's, I guess that's my point. Sure. So LLM degrees, uh, legal masters of law are good for specialized areas of law. Like you can do an LLM degree, like bank. Okay. So I'll use bankruptcy for example, because that's what I did. Um, the bankruptcy code is incredibly intricate. And sections refer to other sections, refer to bankruptcy rules. And it is really a, a field of law that's great when you've been doing it for a long time because you just learn the intricacy of the bankruptcy code as you, as you work. The LM bankruptcy degree and LM programs in general are like getting a master's degree in the law. So I like to say I have a master's degree, but I really don't like saying that because I don't say it at all. Um, but it's just fun when describing like this. And what that what they do is they are either another year of law school or half a year if you've been taking classes while you were at law school. Um, and they help to have professionals who are already practicing in the field. Like my professors were bankruptcy judges. They were bankruptcy practitioners who have been in the field for years. They were bankruptcy academics who were specialized in the area. I was able to learn from some of the top bankruptcy minds in the field um, when I was in the program. And that gave me a great network with people to start my career with and a great insight into the law. But it is absolutely not necessary to become a bankruptcy lawyer having an LLM de bankruptcy degree. I mean, there are LLM degrees for a variety of things. There are LLM degrees for constitutional law or other types of areas, uh, tax, a tax LM is very popular, again, because the tax code is also like the bankruptcy code, it's very intricate. But these are things that are in addition to and not required of to go and practice once you graduate from law school. With that also said, is it possible um, or how easy is it from if you're practicing or you go into one field of law to move from one to another? Uh, do you usually see that within your field or is it usually once you've kind of established yourself in a particular field, you're kind of stayed within that field? So when you, if you've established yourself, like it would be, it would be hard for me 13 years in um, to to shift to a whole nother area of law. What you, what you could do is um, build out your practice naturally as a progression as, as while you've been working. So for example, in my, in my current firm, I started primarily as a bankruptcy uh, and restructuring associate. Through the cases that I've worked on, I have 
also added a whole area of corporate governance, which is like people who run the companies and defense work in case, you know, something happens or someone sues them for saying they did something wrong with the company. Like that kind of developed through my bankruptcy work because I had cases where that issue came up in bankruptcy cases. And because I was interested in it and I pursued it, I now do both. So it's more of a natural progression. It's in, you can be a generalist, which is you can, but that's usually more like a smaller firm. Like a, a smaller firm being a generalist is, is probably more the norm than not uh, because, uh, but there are like firms that are bankruptcy specific or matrimonial specific. But in, in terms of just shifting wholeheartedly from area to area, it's not as easy as uh, one would think. Also because like, let's say I wanted to go into matrimonial law right now. Anywhere I would look for a job would look at my resume and say, all of this says is bankruptcy. Why should we possibly put you in this position? You don't know anything about it. And then you have to start from scratch. Not a bad thing if you really just want to. I mean, that's the other thing. Like, your skills are transferable. My litigation skills as a bankruptcy associate, because I go to court, I argue motions, I argue cases, I've had hearings, I've had trials. Those are skills I can apply in any litigation context. It's just the law that's different. And that's, that's good. And it keeps it interesting. Like one of the things that I tell a lot of associates is that one way to get that other type of experience besides your practice area is to get um, pro bono cases. And the, the pro bono cases are some of my most favorite cases to, to work on. I have... I've done pro bono cases for individuals who are seeking asylum in this country. I am not an immigration attorney, but the firm supports a pro bono work for asylum cases. I have cases where I am assisting an individual who is on death, death row and making sure that his trial was done fairly. I'm doing cases where I have individuals who are transgender, who are seeking to have their name changed to reflect their gender identity. I've done cases where I'm pursuing, uh, inju- um, well, we were, I was working on a case and I still am against the previous presidential administration regarding uh, laws they put into place regarding discrimination of LGBTQ individuals. That, that's constitutional law. And I am not a constitutional lawyer, but I'm very much involved in the case and I'm working on it. And I might, it's my skills that are transferable there. Um, we also had a question in the chat um, that asked, how did you know you wanted to study law? So that kind of, great question. The study of law it is mostly what I thought you could do with it. Like I, I remember, um, the cases that I would see in the newspaper, the movies I would watch, TV shows, books I would read. And I always really liked um, the law. I thought it was interesting. And it always seemed really impressive. They always have these big speeches. Um, and so I was interested in the law. But, but what I did was I didn't just jump into law school. I don't think you should, anyone should ever jump into any form of programming without testing it out a little bit first. And what that I mean is like, take classes in the area. Like if you're in high school, if there's a debate club, a lot of law, if you're a litigator is debating and arguing back and forth. If you're in college, there are pre-law classes. You don't have to take a pre-law program, but take like a constitutional law class, take a matrimonial law class. A lot of, usually those are taught by adjunct professors who are practicing attorneys. One of my favorite classes when I was in college was a business law class that was taught by a local attorney who would come in at night and he was a fantastic teacher. His day job was he was a lawyer, but he was teaching us. And it, it really helped to solidify the idea for me that I wanted to go to law school. Um, and then I did. Now you go, and I mentioned this earlier, but I'm, but I'm serious that if you start law school and you don't like law school, it's okay to not come back to the second year or the third year. If, if you realize you hate something, forcing yourself to do it is not going to help you. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you should slack your way through it and be like, oh, I didn't get a good grade. Like work hard, law school is hard, um, but give yourself that opportunity. There are people who started law school who hated it and now they're doctors. There are people who started law school, hated it, and now they're entrepreneurs. You're never set into one thing. And if you put yourself in the mindset that you are, you're selling yourself short. Um, we also had another question. Uh, when it comes to international law, what are your recommendations? Um, I hate to be asking more a little more specific, but I can try, I'll try to answer. And then if I'm not answering, please just add more to the chat. Um, with international law, it really depends on the field that you want to practice. So, you know, as, as we as a global society are getting more and more entwined with internationally in terms of finances and deals, there are certain areas of law that lend itself more to an international focus. Um, anything transactional tends to be a greater deal of um, international uh, cross border. I see the question in the chat. Hold on. American yeah. attorney with either the US government or the UN. Oh, great. Okay, here. All right. If you want to do that, what I highly recommend is there are um, obviously programs at law school classes focused on international law. And they'll be, they'll be specific. We want to be like international law. It'll be like international law and X. Um, or like maritime law, like stuff that really touches across across borders thing. And the best part about that is, um, if you want to be a UN attorney, UN international attorney, or something like that, is internships. Internship, internship, internships, or externships, where you get credit for it for doing it. And the point is, like you can apply to the UN to be a summer associate or summer intern. You can apply to law firms that have specific international practices where they do um, business with their offices in other countries. Like Baker Hostetler has 14 offices, has 14, 15, 16 offices in the United States. We don't have an office in London or Paris, but there are um, cases that we work on with attorneys in those countries. If you want to do an international basis, more of a diplomatic focus, then that's um, an area that you should look into in terms of where you intern and the classes you take. Some law schools, um, like maybe GW, are, that are more focused in federal international issues, maybe a greater pipeline to get you into those roles. Um, so when you're looking at law schools, you should look to see what their curriculum is and their background is and where their alums end up. Like where are the people who go to law school, like what kind of jobs have they gotten? You know, if they have, there are these things in law school called law reviews and law journals. And what those are, are um, it's kind of what they sound like. They're magazines, books, where practicing attorneys will write papers on areas of law. And some of those will have an international focus. Like St. John's has an international law journal and they focus on those types of things that a bankruptcy law journal, which I was on, does not. So that's something to keep in mind um, when considering it. But it's not a one size fits all. So when you're making your decisions about where you go to law school or how you want to do your career, keep that in mind, but also really try to network with um, your school's career office, both college and um, law school to try to meet and shadow attorneys who are in those professions that you may be able to connect with and meet up with. That actually leads into another um, question that was in the chat earlier was about internships. I know you had mentioned internships a couple times. Um, and the question was like, how would you go about finding those internships? Is it something specifically that was arranged by school or is it something that you needed to research on your own? How did those come about? All of the above. It's a terrible <laughs> answer, I know. But, but, but let me back up. So the internships that I, I found, um, the clinics, the school set up. The DA's office, they, I applied. I mean, they had positions and spots and I researched because I at one point thought about becoming a DA. It, I didn't obviously. Um, 
for the law firms, I researched on my own to see, you know, what firms were offering positions that I thought I could really benefit from and learn from. And then I just applied. So the but also the law schools and colleges have fantastic alumni networks. Like St. John's Law School has an amazing alumni network that I was able to tap into when I was looking for a job, when I was looking for internships, because a lot of alums really do like giving back. I'm a mentor for law students and I've been a mentor for law students for the last, I'm not even saying the years anymore. Um, reach out. No, I would love to think that there's always like a book, this is always a book story where you are magically chosen by someone to be the next best thing. But all those lawyers on the Supreme Court, all the lawyers that you see with these huge cases, they all started from the exact same place that you're starting from, zero. They, some may, yeah, look, some may have had connections, not gonna lie. But like, everyone learns, everyone picks the law up. So when you're interning, when you're looking for things, like keep an open mind for that and take your interest into account. Like I, have a, I know attorneys who love video games and are now building out areas of the law where they can practice law specifically on video game issues. That's amazing. IP lawyers who are really into social media are able to build that into the life. So if you can build something into your career that you enjoy, all the better for it. There was another question. Yes. So the other question in the chat was, um, do you think I should stay at St. John's University for law school or should I try to possibly branch out? We could talk afterwards if you like. Um, if you like St. John's, stay at St. John's. If you think you would like to go somewhere else, consider it. Again, don't get stuck into things. Um, I'm happy to talk to you separately if, if you like specifically want to talk about it. Um, but I, I will say this: if you if you just if you if you're in law school anywhere, we'll we'll take out of St. John's context. Um, if you're in law school anywhere or any program whatsoever. What I said earlier is really take to heart. The idea being that, you know, at the end of the day, it's your happiness that, that truly is important. You're the one who has to live in this career that you're choosing. If you're not happy about the law school that you're at or the medical school that you're at or the field that you're in, you know, life's short, especially this past year has shown us anything. Um, you need to take care of yourself. That, that's primary to, to everything here. Um, so if, you, if, if, you, if you're interested in something, pursue it. If you wanna to go to law school, take classes, talk to lawyers. Most lawyers are happy to talk. Some lawyers just love to talk, um, but most lawyers are happy to talk about their, their lives and what they do and the impacts that it has both on their personal life and in their careers. Um, there's, mo most people, are, are happy to be there to listen and to give advice. I like to think that I am one of those people. Why somebody have to ask me to do this? Um, there's a great deal of knowledge out there and you just have to find it. And look, it's not always gonna be handed to you, but if you go to look for it, you, you'll get it some way or the other. And uh, we'll definitely we'll definitely stay on for a few minutes afterwards if you want to ask personal questions. So that's not a problem at all. Um, okay, some other questions that I wanted to ask is kind of just in general about your day to day. Like, how is it day to day in the field at your firm? Like a generalization. What is your day to day like? Emails. So many emails. Um, now, as a litigator, I know I, I do a lot of emails. <laughs> I done I done some transactional stuff. And they get so many emails. <laughs> um, so emails are a lot, meetings are a lot. One great thing about the law and is that it, it's incredibly collaborative. My thoughts on what a decision from a judge means may differ from what Samantha's thoughts on that decision may mean. And so then we need to discuss it. If I think I'm working on a case 
And this could be a good a good cause of action. And what a cause of action is, is like a, a request for, um, a, you're seeking a remedy for a specific harm. Um, what I think is good, another attorney may not. And then we have to debate. It's not a me angry debate. It, it's an exchange of ideas and discussion. I mean, look, when you, the fun, look at it this way. When you're in court, you're both there because you think you're right. And you, when, you file law, when you file lawsuits and you file papers, you can't file frivolous, if you're a lawyer, you can't file frivolous papers. You have to have some belief that what you're, what you're filing is, is justifiable and can be supported. And then the judge gets to decide if you are right or wrong, or if you're partially right or you're partially wrong. So you have three individuals in that room, all of whom may have a different idea of what the law is and how to apply it. And that's an incredibly fascinating discussion to have, that you're looking at the same thing and you're all seeing three different things. If you're looking at a contract for interpretation, maybe where the comma is placed, and there are lawsuits specifically about this, where the comma is placed can incredibly impact the outcome of that litigation. That's wild. Like a drafting error could change things. I mean, um, and what we do. So emails, meetings, writing, researching. Those are the four primary things they do. Phone calls too. Um, but that's a lot of what being a lawyer is. You, most lawsuits rarely go to trial. Most lawsuits get settled well before the trial date, or even they do try, on the eve of trial. So you really don't get these bombastic scenes in the courtroom where lawyers say something, they slam the podium, they yell at the witness, the witness yells back, someone confesses to murder, and then the show end, and credits begin. Um, that's not the day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day is really minute by minute, writing, drafting, reacting to situations and developing it and thinking things through. No, some lawsuits are dozens of pages, if not more than hundred pages long, if not more than that. Um, that takes time to develop. That's not like, no one just like snaps their finger, just happens. Like a lot of thought goes into these things. Um, another question I would have coming out of law school can expect, um, both in trying to find a position, um, how to go about that, how hard that is, and also salary. I mean, there's a lot of uh, assumptions made on what a starting salary for a lawyer would be. What would what are some things that you can share with us and on those aspects? Okay, um, let's start with looking for jobs. Looking for jobs is hard. When I went when I got out of law school, I went to clerk for a judge first. But before I got the job working for her, I applied to a lot of firms and a lot of judges. And I, I lucked out and I got the job and she hired me and I was good. When I was leaving that job, because like I was clerking and, and I can only stay for a few, uh, only four years at the most. I again was looking for a lot of jobs. And what that meant was reaching out to the alumni network at my law school, talking to career services at my law school, turning around and doing my own research on law firms, sending out mass stacks of mail to firms, just hoping someone saw my application and wants to give me a shot emailing firm that were posting for positions, talking to friends I knew that who had jobs, family I knew that had jobs, family that had friends that were lawyers that had jobs. I mean, it's, there's no one size fits all. And there's no one firm that is perfect for everybody. Everything's different. Um, there are firms that are solo, there are people who are solo practitioners and there are people who were at firms with more than a thousand attorneys. I started my job working for a firm that had about 15 attorneys, the practice of law. Um, and now I'm at a firm with about a thousand attorneys. It, it's wild. You can work for a governmental agency, state, federal, you can work for in-house counsel at a corporation. I mean, there's all these types of legal positions out there. There are pro bono, there are organizations that specifically do pro bono work. There are organizations that um, are charitable endeavors that need attorneys. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. In terms of salary, 
There is a wide gap. Um, I'll put it this way. If you're going into the law expecting to be making a, an absurd amount of money, uh, that absurd amount of money is very much the exception and not the norm. Like I, um, I had friends who would be like, we would go out for dinner. They like, oh, he can pay for the check. He's a, he's a lawyer. And I'd like to look at them and be like, are you out of your mind? What? You make more money than I do. Like, come on. Um, so the, the idea that law is a blank check to a great fortune is, is wrong. Um, not to say that you can't get a job at a place that may help that, but if you go in expecting that, you're going to be sorely mistaken. My next question also would uh, go back to kind of, you know, the small versus the large firms. Um, obviously you've worked in both. Can you talk a little bit about some of the benefits and the drawbacks of each of them, like working for a small versus a large firm? Sure. Um, so working at a small firm, you get to know everyone really, really well. Because there's only so many of you in that office. Um, and what you'll get is a lot of great deal more of hands-on experience when you start practicing. You know, a big firm can take um, additional time that, they, that it wants to train their associates to go to court. Like if you're at a, a big firm and you're a first year associate, you are not trying a, a court case within the first week, not even the first year, not even for several years. What, what you are doing is you are working with senior associates, partners, who are training you. The law firm will have programs, like um, they could have deposition training programs, trial training programs, all these things. And the idea that they are training you through that process so you can go to court. You work at a small firm, you're probably in court the next day. I was in court when I joined my first firm, I think I was in court within the week of my joining that firm. And it was for the smallest, most ministerial type of motion possible that you could bring in bankruptcy court. In bankruptcy court. And I was beyond nervous for doing it. Um, but it's a great training experience because you, it's literally a trial by fire, well, figuratively speaking. Um, you literally wrong, sorry. We're a librarian, you're really mad at me, sorry. Um, but it, it, it's, a different, it's a different world. It's a different world. I was at my other firm for four years. I've been at my current firm for four years. You just see different things when you join the law and what, what, you're, what you're practicing. I mean, at a small firm, there aren't 10 bodies behind you that can go into do court if something comes up. At a big firm, if I, if I can't do it, there's probably a bunch of my associates who are around who can handle something. Um, but that, that's really the difference. Like it, it, it's more of the hands-on um, thrown into it mentality. Like my first day at, at my first firm, stack of folders this big was put on my desk. And that's how I started, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but that experience helped me get my current job. Also, um, what about, say you're practicing in one state, moving from one state to another, or even another country. Um, obviously, there's, uh, you know, um, exams and, and certifications that go along with that. So how, how um, would you go about doing that if you needed to do that? Sure. So when you, like every bar, sorry, every, sorry, let me go back. Every state has its own bar exam to take. Now, since it's been some, now it's changed since I went to law school, but fundamentally you can't just practice a law in whatever state you want to choose to go to. I can't get a law degree in New York and then just move to California tomorrow and start practicing law there. What, what you do is you take the bar exam, you pass the bar, hopefully. And then what you do is, you depending on the state, they have this thing called reciprocity. And what reciprocity is, is that another state will accept you having gotten your law license and ability to practice in, let's say, New York, and they'll let you practice in their state. So like for Pennsylvania, you have to have been practicing for five years in New York continuously. Um, I believe this is the case. It was when I was looking, at one point I was looking to move years ago. Um, and only after having practiced for five years could I not have to take the bar, did I not take the bar exam again in Pennsylvania? 
other states require you to take the bar exam um, if you move there. So that's something to consider. Like if you are in New York and you decide, you know, and you're and you're thinking about practicing in New York and maybe going somewhere else, like, well, what state will have reciprocity? How long have I been practicing in New York? And just look at the requirements if you want to move. You may take the bar exam again. I never want to. That was an awful experience. Um, but I passed. Uh, but that's but that's the idea. Something to keep in mind. I mean, there's no there's no magic wand that waves you into every other state. Some states do let you have reciprocity. Some states don't. You have to you have to either pay money for the fee and then take the test again, or just pay the money for the fee. Um, okay, so we are getting close to the end of our time uh, tonight. So I am going to ask if anybody has any last minute questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat um, before we head out. Um, but I guess one of my last questions that I have is what advice can you give to somebody who is in high school right now that is interested in law, some things that they should be doing now, either to prepare themselves for um, you know, entering college, uh, or considering, you know, working on some skills that can then help them once they do eventually go to law school. Talk to lawyers. It, I feel like I'm like being the, the drum here, but um, if you are in high school and you were considering going to law school, first go to college. Um, once, but when you're considering college, Consider if they have a pre-law program. You don't have to do it, but see what kind of classes they have. See who's teaching those classes. See if it's practitioners or if it's just professors. Sometimes it's both. I'm not saying one or the other is bad, but again, like one thing about the law is you want as much information as possible. Like you should be getting as much information as possible. You should, you should be making an informed decision when you go um, towards any path, whether it be law school or something else. So. If you're in high school, talk to your guidance counselors. Say you're interested in pursuing a career in law. See if they can put you in touch with any, um, the local DA's office, the local public defender's office, any local law firm that are interested in helping in talking to or mentoring students. When, if you have family or friends that you know who are lawyers, ask them for their advice, talk to them. Like, like I'm doing right now, they would hopefully talk to you just the same. If once you get into college, at least take one class in the law, a constitutional law class, just something, just so you can see what, what it's actually like. Because if you're going, if you just go straight to law school without actually having an understanding of what it is, then you're, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because you're, you're kind of forcing yourself to be in the law school mentality where you may realize you don't like it, or you may love it. I know, I, know, I have attorney, friends who are attorneys who love reviewing cases and analyzing them and picking them apart. I know others who absolutely hate it um, and they don't do it. But that's something you really should give yourself the opportunity to learn those things and consider those things. What do you have to lose? Um, so I just want to make sure everybody sees um, that, Michael, thank you so much for putting your email address in the chat. If you have any questions, you can feel free to either email Michael uh, directly, or you can always send your questions to teens at levittownpl.org, and we will make sure that we get them to Michael as well. Um, also, I just wanted to... But, yeah, <laughs> add them in the chat, or as you can add anything as you want. Um, and just before we get going, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have some more of these wonderful programs coming up. Um, on February 9th, we'll be meeting with a special education teacher. Um, and then on March 30th, we'll be meeting with an entrepreneur who started her very own clothing line. Um, we also have some of the college major exploration programs coming up on February 23rd. We'll be meeting with a representative from Malloy College who will be discussing their nursing program. Um, and then on March 10th, we'll be meeting with a representative from Farmingdale State who will be talking about their criminal justice program. So with that said, I just wanna say thank you again to Michael for joining us um, and for all of your wonderful advice. We will be hanging on the call if anybody wants to ask specific questions uh, for a few minutes. I encourage everyone, please check our website. We're constantly adding new programs every single day um, at www.levittownpl.org. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me.